All right, let's take a look at these MRI images. At first glance, we're seeing a clear abnormality in the left internal carotid artery. Normally, the internal carotid artery should show a signal void due to the rapid flow of blood, but here, there's a loss of that normal signal void. Instead, we're seeing a high signal intensity on both T1 and T2 weighted images. That's definitely something worth focusing on because it suggests something within the artery itself, most likely blood products. Now when we see this high signal intensity, especially in the setting of a vessel, we immediately start thinking about thrombus formation. The signal characteristics are key here. A high signal on both T1 and T2 is consistent with subacute thrombus that's typically in the 12 to 48 hour range. So what we're dealing with is most likely a subacute dissection of the internal carotid artery. As I keep reviewing the images, there's also a small residual area of flow void anteriorly, which suggests there's still some flow, but the stenosis is quite significant. This aligns with the patient's clinical presentation. Where they might be experiencing neurological symptoms related to disruption of the sympathetic chain, which runs alongside the internal carotid artery. A key thing to note here is that the contralateral carotid artery and vertebral arteries appear completely normal, ruling out more diffuse vascular involvement, like a connective tissue disorder, such as Marfan syndrome or Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which often predispose to multiple dissections. What about differentials at this stage? Well, a carotid artery occlusion might be one consideration, but the presence of high signal within the vessel makes arterial dissection a much more likely explanation. Another possibility could be fibromuscular dysplasia, which tends to show up as alternating stenosis and dilation on imaging, something we call the string of beads appearance. But again, the pattern we're seeing here with a smooth, long segment of high signal suggests we're more likely dealing with a dissection. Now, you might be asking, what could have caused this dissection? Dissections can occur spontaneously, especially in patients with underlying conditions like collagen vascular disorders. However, a dissection can also follow minor trauma, like hyperextension. Something as simple as stretching your neck awkwardly or a minor car accident could trigger it. Looking at the imaging findings, it's clear that this is an isolated dissection, as the other vessels in the neck and vertebrobasilar system appear unremarkable. The absence of an intimal flap on this particular MRI is not unusual in early stages, but further imaging, such as MRA or CTA, could help confirm this and assess the exact extent of the dissection. This would also be useful to check for any potential complications, like thromboembolism, that could lead to a stroke. The next question in the VIVA exam might be, how do we distinguish between an acute thrombus and a subacute th thrombus on MRI? The answer lies in the signal intensities. An acute thrombus is typically isointense or hypointense on T1 and hypointense on T2. But in this case, the subacute thrombus is hyperintense on both sequences due to the presence of methemoglobin, which is a breakdown product of blood that appears after about 12 hours it's important to correlate the imaging findings with the clinical picture. The patient here has a left-sided Horner syndrome, which is highly suspicious for an internal carotid artery dissection. Why? Because the sympathetic chain lies right next to the artery, and any disruption in blood flow or direct trauma can affect the nerve supply, leading to ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis, the classic signs of Horner syndrome. These findings fit together like puzzle pieces. So what's next for this patient? Well, I'd recommend an urgent referral for neurovascular imaging, most likely MRA or CTA, to confirm the extent of the dissection and guide treatment. We'll likely start the patient on anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy to prevent thromboembolism and reduce the risk of ischemic stroke. In severe cases, endovascular stenting could be considered to restore blood flow, but that's something the vascular team would decide based on further imaging. Before wrapping up, the examiners might ask, what are some risk factors for carotid artery dissection? The answer to that would include trauma, like we discussed, but also collagen vascular diseases like Marfan syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. 
Additionally, arterial dissection can sometimes occur spontaneously without any obvious precipitating event, especially in younger patients. So in summary, this case points to a left internal carotid artery dissection, most likely subacute in nature, given the high signal intensity on MRI. The findings correlate well with the patient's Horner's syndrome, which is a classic clinical feature of carotid dissection. Immediate neurovascular imaging and medical management would be the next steps to prevent any complications, especially stroke. Thanks for following along with this case. If you found this explanation helpful, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on Radiology Made Easy for more radiology cases that'll help you ace your exams and stay sharp.